Okay, so I'll, I'll get on with the class material. In the previous class, in, in Tuesday's class, we talked about the particle-like nature of light. So it's kind of a gran granularity of light. In today's class, we're going to talk about the wave-like nature of matter. So kind of a, a fuzziness of, of matter. What we're doing is stepping from a world in which light was just a wave, uh, matter is just particles, and waves and particles are very different, uh, light and matter are very different, to a world, the quantum world, in which uh, light exhibits both particle and wave-like properties. Matter exhibits both particle and wave-like properties. And there's kind of a, a synergy, a synthesis of our descriptions of light and matter. So that, that's a very big step. It's also a complication in our understanding of light and matter, because when we think of things as waves, say light as classical light as a wave, when we think of matter as particles, classical particles of matter, we have everyday experience of things that are waves, things that are particles. We don't have any everyday experience of things that exhibit both particle-like properties and wave-like properties. So we don't have any experience of the subatomic particles and the photons of light that make up the quantum world. So that's that's a challenge, just a challenge for the years, a challenge for me to imagine what this world is really like, because we have no analogy, no e equivalent to this world in our e everyday everyday lives. Um, I'll talk about a little bit in the second bullet here about evidence for the wave na nature of matter. The evidence for wave nature of matter is actually similar to the evidence for wave nature of light. It's, it's through observation of interference effects and diffraction effects. Uh, we saw that with light, for example, two slit experiment. We'll see it here um, with, with matter, that matter actually exhibits interference and diffraction effects. And then finally, the third bullet here, I wanna talk about a dramatic change in our conception of the universe that occurred with the understanding of the quantum world. Before the understanding of the quantum world, in the sort of classical world, uh, the universe was thought of as kind of a clockwork universe, a deterministic universe, or at least in principle, if you knew the location of every particle in the universe, you knew the movement of every particle in the universe, uh, you knew the forces between all the particles in the universe, you could predict what was going to happen in the future. You could exactly predict what was going to happen in the future. After quantum, the, the quantum mechanics was discovered, after the quantum nature of matter and light was discovered, uh, this deterministic, this clockwork unit, universe broke down. In quantum universe, uh, you cannot predict uh, exactly the future. You cannot know exactly the motion and the position of particles in the present. Uh, there's a probabilistic notion of the universe. And so we're going to discuss that. So firstly, this synthesis of light and matter, which is based on both light and matter, exist, exhibiting both wave-like and particle-like properties. Let me, let me say a few words about that. So on this slide here, I've got a recap of the classical description of matter that's over here on the left-hand side and the classical description of light. And in the classical description of matter, I'm thinking of some, some particle, maybe a, a billiard ball, for example. And in the classical description of light, I'm thinking of... Um, uh, an electromagnetic wave, as predicted by James Clark Maxwell, that is composed of oscillating, vibrating, self-sustaining electric and magnetic fields. The matter particle, that's a kind of 
localized, concentrated, discrete object. That's what we mean by a particle. And it's described by its energy associated with its motion and its momentum associated with its motion. So that's what we think of as a classical particle. Uh, on the right-hand side, light, well, that's a light is a non-localized, it's kind of a diffuse, a continuous wave. It's a smooth uh, wave, and it's described by a frequency, the uh, rate in time at which the electric and magnetic fields vibrate, and a uh, wavelength, the uh, spatial distance between the vibrations of the uh, electric and magnetic fields. So that's our description of classical description of light. In the quantum world, the quantum description of light, which is over here on the right, we talked about in the last class, and the quantum description of matter, which we're talking about in this class, and it's over here on the left, um, th these, are, these are both more complicated. So as we met in the last class over here on the right, uh, light exhibits both wave-like properties, uh, a non-localized wave with a frequency and a wave -like, wavelength, but it also exhibits particle-like properties. It also exhibits a sort of granularity in that when it's emitted and when it's absorbed and when it propagates, it, it's emitted, absorbed and propagates as little packets of electromagnetic fields. Uh, that act as quanta or particles, they carry certain energy, they carry certain momentum. So it has particle-like features too. Uh, what we're gonna discover in today's class, uh, particles, which we think thought of as kind of localized objects carrying energy and momentum, they, they have a, a, a kind of diffuseness to them, a, 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 a fuzziness or uncertainty to them. Uh, and they exhibit, wave-like properties. They exhibit interference, they exhibit uh, diffraction, the classic wave-like properties. Um, uh, they have associated with them a frequency and they have an associated wavelength. And we'll examine the frequency and wavelength associated with, um, with particles. Uh, so this really is a synthesis, a joining together, a kind of unification of a description of light and matter. Um, because now they're, they're both these strange quantities, these strange objects that have uh, both particle-like properties and wave-like properties. They're no longer simply either a particle or simply a wave. And, and that's, um, in, in one sense, it's a big step forward in this sort of synthesis, this unification of light and matter. In, in, a, in another sense, it's a big complication for us to understand because we have no every, everyday experience of anything that has both wave-like, particle-like properties in our everyday lives. The scale, the sort of size scale of the granularity of light, and the size scale of the fuzziness of matter, me meaning at what distance scales would you see the granularity of light, would you see the fuzziness of matter, is set by a famous physics constant. We met it in the last class. It's, it's Planck's constant. It's this constant here. Uh, it's given this symbol H. I think the story of the symbol H is that um, it was just a hypothesis. And so H is for hypothesis that became a, a fact. And so now H is a, Planck's constant is a fact. Uh, it has this, oops, has this um, value uh, that has units of uh, energy times time, joules, seconds. And in those units, it's, it's an incredibly small number. So in everyday units, it's an incredibly small number, meaning that its effects are really in the subatomic world, in the microscopic world, because of uh, Planck's constant being so small. Um, if H was zero, so if Planck's constant were actually zero, now it's it's not zero, but it's, it's very small. If H was zero, then we would, light would be a, a classical, light wave. It would just have uh, wave-like properties. It would be the light that was predicted by Maxwell. If H was zero, 
then uh, matter's fuzziness, matter's wave-like properties would vanish. And we just see um, uh, matter as particle-like matter, Newton's uh, particle-like matter. Um, if H was not 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34, there, it, rather it was 6.6 .6 joule seconds. So if it was an everyday scale rather than a microscopic scale, um, then, then the these strange features uh, of of light and matter, this wave like and particle like properties of light and matter, they that would be visible in our everyday world. Uh, and so, if it was an everyday number, it would be visible in our everyday world. So that's introducing the eye, the conception of particle like wave like properties of matter as well as what we met in the last class particle like and wave like properties of of of, of light and now I want to talk about a, an important equation for the scale of the wave like properties of matter and this is due to uh, a scientist called uh, his last name is de broglie a french scientist and he has this this louis de broglie but it's actually this long chain of names. I don't know any other scientists in, in physics that has such a, um, a string of first names, but, but apparently he did. Um, he, it's an interesting story. So he was the first person to hypothesize that particles of nature, for example, an electron, have, have wave-like properties. So he made this postulate and he made it in his uh, PhD thesis. Um, this is the only physics PhD thesis that I know of where the, um, the thesis material was awarded the Nobel Prize. So he, he received a Nobel Prize for his, for his dissertation uh, for this idea that particles like electrons have wave-like properties. Um, it's also an interesting thesis, PhD dissertation, normally there are hundreds of pages long, his was just three pages of long. So it's a very, um, uh, it's a very unusual uh, thesis in, in both those respects. Anyway, that's a bit of history. You probably didn't want to know it. Um, here's a slide I'm recycling from earlier on. It has a, um, a, a particle over here on the left-hand side with its classical energy and momentum, a wave over here on the right-hand side with its classical wavelength and frequency. But I've added to this slide the fact that the particle has wave-like properties, and I've added it through this equation here, that the, um, the, the light, the the light also has particle-like properties, and I've added it through this, this equation here. So this equation that E equals Planck's constant times frequency for light waves was the key equation with, that we met in the last class that defined the granularity of light. And it involved Planck's constant, as I say, that sets the scale of these effects, the granularity of light. The parallel to that is this equation due to de Broglie. De Broglie said that the, um, the wavelength associated with uh, an electron or some other subatomic particle uh, of matter. Uh, that wavelength is given by this equation here. Here is the particle's momentum. And here again is Planck's constant that sets the scale of these quantum effects. In this case, the, the fu fuzziness, the kind of diffuseness of the, um, the, the particle. And so this, this equation here that the wavelength of a particle is equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the particle is the parallel for this equation over here, which was for light, the uh, energy of a packet of light in terms of Planck's constant and the, the frequency of the light. Um, note that in the particle case, we're kind of talking about the momentum of the particles and relating that to wave-like effects. In the wave case, we were talking about the uh, energy of the uh, photons and relating that to the wave-like property of, of frequency. Um, energy and momentum 
are related to one another. We met a E equation when talking about relativity, that the relativistic equation for energy uh, and its relation to momentum was this equation here. So this was from a few classes ago. In the case of light, this equation here, light is particles, uh, has this particle-like properties. The, the particles of light, the photons are massless. So in that case, the relationship between the momentum and the energy of a light particle is actually this simpler equation here. It's just the equation on the left-hand side for the energy-momentum relationship where the mass is zero. So um, although in one case, the Broglie specified the relationship between momentum and wavelength, whereas Planck specified the relationship between energy and frequency, momentum and energy are themselves related to one another. Um, and so uh, the, it, the, the connection is between particle light properties of frequency and wavelength, and uh, sorry, wavelength properties of frequency and wavelength, and then particle light properties of, of momentum and energy. They're all joined together. So we've got a kind of unified um, relationships, unified description now of light and matter. That's what I'm saying downstairs. Um, Light and matter are no longer either just waves or matter. They are wave particle entities, these strange, these peculiar, these hard to imagine, hard to believe wave particle en entities. Let's look at um, a couple of examples of, of matter waves. Now, on this slide here, this is um, matter waves for an everyday object. So we could calculate the um, wavelength of the matter waves for an everyday object, uh, this basketball. And then on the next slide, we're going to calculate the wavelength of the matter waves for not an everyday, well, sort of an everyday object, but a subatomic object and an electron. So we do both these cases. So uh, just picking an example, a basketball from the everyday world and picking an example from the, the, the sub subatomic world. So uh, the question says, calculate the wavelength of a 0.6 kilogram basketball with a speed of 10 meters per second. For us to imagine this basketball, um, 0.6 kilograms, I guess that's the weight of the basketball, um, and um, a speed of 10 meters per second. So de Broglie is claiming that this particle this basketball has a is a has a corresponding matter wave, and that matter wave has a corresponding wavelength according to his equation that lambda equals Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the particle or the basketball. So let's see if we can figure that out. The first thing that we've got to do is actually figure out the figure out the the momentum of the particle because the relationship for matter waves is between momentum and wavelength, not speed and wavelength. So we've got to do that. And um, that's what I'm, I'm going to try and use the, the light pen here if I'm capable. This might not work for me. Here we are, sort of works. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to start with this equation here. So this is the relationship between momentum of the basketball, the velocity of the basketball, and the mass, the mass of the basketball. And we're going to calculate a simple calculation from physics 211. And we're just going to calculate the momentum of the basketball because that's related to the, the wavelength. So we've got our um, 0.6 kilogram basketball. We've got our 10 meters per second speed, motion of the basketball. And look, I can do this in my head. Uh, 0.6 times 10 is 6. This is a momentum of six kilograms meters per second or six joules seconds per meter. Uh, this might be a handier unit. I mean, these are two units are equivalent to one another, but this might be handier for us when we move to the matter one. So it will be handier to us than this one over here when we move to, towards the matter one. So now we know the um, momentum of our particle, we can uh, step down from the calculation of the momentum to this this new idea, calculating the corresponding wavelength of these matter waves. So this is de Broglie's equation here. This is the, the equation that 
you look it up in his three page dissertation that he got the Nobel Prize for, uh, says that the wavelength is equal Planck's constant divided by the momentum. Uh, Planck's constant, we've already quoted that, is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. So I plug that value in. Uh, the, the momentum of the basketball, so every day size in these units of joules and seconds and meters, is six joules seconds per meter. So if we look at this, we're dividing what is a really, really tiny number by a uh, everyday number. This comes out to be here, look here, 10 to the minus 34 meters. You can see that the units are just meters. This is why I put it, the momentum in these units. The joule seconds in the numerator of Planck's constant cancel with the joule seconds in the denominator for the momentum. And we're just left with basically one over one over meters, which is just meters here. And so basketballs do have a matter wavelength, but that matter wavelength is incredibly tiny. You know, the size of the atom, what's the size of the atom? It's about 10 to the minus 10 meters. The size of the nucleus inside of the atom, what's that? It's about 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 15 meters, depending on the nucleus. This is this is 10 to the minus 20 smaller than that. We're never going to see this wavelength. So this is completely negligible in our everyday lives. Okay, I'm going to move on to the case of the electron. Uh, let me try and clear the screen. And so now we're going to do the same calculation for a, an electron with a speed of a million meters per second. We're going to see what the wave, wavelength is here. Uh, we've got to work through the same steps. So I'm going to do the same procedure. I'm just going to do it more quickly. Now we're just doing it again for, for our uh, uh, electron here. So um, the first thing we've got to do is calculate the momentum. Uh, we know the speed. We can look up the electron's mass. We can calculate the momentum because, again, it's the momentum that's um, that's that's related to the uh, wavelength. So that's my starting point again. Here's the um, here's the momentum of sorry. Here's the mass of an electron. Now this is a bit that's quite different from the basketball. Uh, this mass of an electron is obviously tiny. It's the order ten to the minus thirty kilograms compared to order a kilogram for the basketball. So that's very different. Uh, also, look here. The you know, electron speeds are in, typical in atoms, molecules, are much faster, uh, much, much faster than um, basketball speed. So this is, this is a million meters per second. So this is a large speed. Um, and so if we mold up those, those two factors are very different from the everyday world. They're quite different from the everyday world. We multiply them together. We get a um, momentum that's of order 10 to the minus 20, 24 kilograms meters per second. Or again, we can write it as um, uh, 10 to the minus 24, nine times 10 to the minus 25 in these uh, handier units for our next calculation of joules seconds per meter. Okay, so now I head downstairs. Uh, that my writing is bad enough uh, on the um, in, in lecture class, but it's even worse with the light pen. So we're going to have to live with that. Uh, we we walk downstairs here to de Broglie's equation. There is three page dissertation that the matter waves wavelength uh, lambda here on the left is Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the particle. So here I am filling in filling in um, Planck's constant. 6.6 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds, filling in the momentum of the particle, uh, 9 times 10 to the minus 25 joules seconds per meter. And if I um, uh, divide one by the other, now I've got one really small number divided by, well, also a really small number um, is bigger than the um, really small number in the numerator. We end up with this wavelength. Now this wavelength is is small compared to everyday size scales, so it's seven point three times ten to the minus ten meters, but 
in the atomic world, this is not a small wavelength. This is the size of, um, uh, it's bigger than an atom. It's a scale of 10 times the size of an atom. So this is a, um, this is a, um, a wavelength. The matter waves will be important for electrons in the subatomic world. And so this is the key feature here. Um, in our everyday lives, we can simply go around ignoring matter waves. We don't have to worry about the fuzziness, the diffuseness of a basketball. In the subatomic world, we have to worry about matter waves. We have to account for matter waves because the wavelengths are significant compared to the size of the atoms, the molecules, the nucleus, and so forth. Okay. Let's go on to the next slide. And um, in the next slide, I just want to talk about the experimental evidence that there are matter waves. So I, I just showed you an equation that was de Broglie's equation for the matter waves and an equation for the wavelength of the matter waves in terms of the momentum uh, of the matter waves. At the time, uh, de Broglie wasn't, uh, I mean, there was no evidence for uh, matter waves, uh, and it took time for evidence of matter waves for particles like electrons to accumulate. And uh, I just want to talk a little bit about that evidence and the classic evidence for the existence of ma matter waves, the classic sort of observation of matter waves were experiments that were done by two, two these are also two famous scientists. One is Bragg, one is Davison. Um, both of these scientists it, were scattering uh, waves off, off materials, off say a, 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 a thin slab of aluminium or a thin slab of iron or some material like that. They would scatter waves off these materials. And um, it was realized that these materials, like a, 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 a piece of iron, a block of iron, or a piece of aluminium or copper, a block of iron, uh, a copper or aluminium, it's, it's made up of regular arrays of atoms, copper atoms or iron atoms or aluminium atoms. And these regular arrays of atoms they act in a way like the inner and outer surfaces of a soap bubble, in that you get reflections off the layers of atoms in the copper, in the iron, in the aluminium, like you get reflection off the top outer surface of a soap bubble, and you get reflection off the um, uh, lower inner surface of the soap bubble. We saw that with soap bubbles, when you get that reflection off the top surface and the bottom surface, you what you actually see is interference effects. You see regions of uh, bright colors of red, bright colors of blue, bright colors of green, and so forth. That's where the, the uh, interference of the uh, light waves from reflection off the top and bottom surfaces of the soap bubble is, is constructive interference. And what Bragg did and what Davison did uh, was re reflect both actually light and matter off the uh, the layers, the layers of atoms in a, um, a a sheet or a slab of iron or copper or aluminium, and they saw equivalent like soap bubble patterns, but for reflection of these solid materials of, of, of different metals. So I want to say a few words about that. Um, Bragg did his work, his kind of this equivalent soap bubble light work, um, but with slabs of iron. Um, he did it by shining um, not regular light, uh, I mean visible light. Uh, he shone X rays, which are short, much shorter wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation, much higher frequencies of electromagnetic radiation onto. A, a slab of iron or copper or aluminium. Uh, in the case, soap bubble case, when you shine visible light on the soap bubble, the interference effects occur because the thickness of the soap bubble is kind of of order of the wavelength of the visible light. 
In the case of shining x-rays on a slab of iron or copper or aluminium, you get the interference effects because the uh, wavelength of the x-rays is of the order of the thickness between the layers of atoms. So again, it's a parallel situation to when we saw the interference patterns with um, visible light being reflected from soap bubbles. It occurred because the wavelength of the visible light is the, the scale of the thickness of the soap bubbles. Here, the wavelength of the x-rays is the, the scale. It's a much smaller wavelength. And it's a, a small wavelength that is the scale of the, the distance between the, the, the layers of iron atoms, copper atoms, aluminum atoms in the, the, the slab of metal ma material. And that that's, causes the, um, the interference patterns. And he got a Nobel Prize for this work. So it's very important work. He got a Nobel Prize because he illuminated the fact that iron, aluminium, copper are actually array, regular arrays of atoms. That wasn't known until this work. So it's very important. Just a little bit of history there for you, and I knew you'd like it. Um, okay, so this this is a picture of how it works, and this picture looks very much like a picture we drew for the soap bubble. Uh, let, let me just explain the picture. Um, over here on the top left, this is the X-rays pouring in. Um, over here on the right, this is the um, scattered X-rays, or kind of the reflected X-rays heading out. Downstairs here, you see um, a, an arrangement, a lattice arrangement of atoms in some material. Maybe this material, I don't know what this material is. It has these red atoms and these blue atoms. Maybe it's sodium chloride. You know, maybe the, the blue atoms are the chlorine and the red atoms are the sodium. And we're seeing the um, reflection of rays off the top surface, the first layer of uh, ions in the sodium chloride and reflection of rays of the uh, second layer of uh, uh, ions in the sodium chloride. And this is just like reflection of the, um, the top outer surface of the soap bubble and the lower surface of the soap bubble. Um, the re rays, the x-rays that are reflected off the lower surface compared to the upper surface, they have to go a little extra distance they have to go this extra distance here, it's d sine theta, an equivalent extra distance over here on the right is also a d sine theta. So they have to go a total extra distance of 2d sine theta, which is written down here. If that extra distance, this little extra distance, and it's of order of the distance between the layers of atoms, if that extra distance is a whole number of wavelengths. M is a whole number, one, two, three, four, so on. I keep keep going. Um, if that extra distance is a whole number of wavelengths, then you get this constructive interference of the X-rays, which are waves, from the um, uh, top surface and from the bottom surface, and you see a, a bright beam of X-rays. If it was half a, half a number of wavelengths, you know, one half a wavelength, three halves a wavelength, five halves a wavelength, you get a uh, destructive interference and you wouldn't see any x-rays uh, corresponding to that particular angle of scattering. Uh, and so this is a very, very famous experiment in, in physics and it is how we first saw the crystalline structure of matter. So it was a, a huge break. This technique was applied by Davison, an, an, another scientist, um, to establish that electrons also have wave-like properties. So he took the Bragg experiment in which X-rays were shone on a metal or a material to expose the lattice arrangement the regular arrangement of the atoms, and he replaced the X-rays, which have short wavelengths, he replaced them with electrons. He replaced them with electrons. Um, if the electrons have wave-like characteristics, then, well, he, he Bragg was shining X-rays, which have wave-like characteristics, uh, on the aluminium or the 
or the iron or the copper and seeing the lattice of ar arrangement of the atoms in the in the material um if you replace the replace the x-rays with electrons and they too had wave-like properties he would see the similar corresponding uh patterns of constructive or destructive interference from the uh, layers of atoms in the, the 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 iron the copper the aluminium from the um the fact that there's interference of the electron matter waves and so that was his idea it just took took basically stole bragg's experiment um uh, but he made a change to Bragg's experiment. Instead of shining X-rays on the uh, crystal, he shone instead electrons on the crystal. His idea was not to understand anything about crystal. That was then known uh, from Bragg. His idea was to understand something about the electrons that was not true, that the electrons have wave-like properties. And, and he got the Nobel this is the second Nobel Prize for diffraction of interference of crystals. He got it because he exposed, he proved the fact that the electrons have wave-like properties. Okay, so his his version of the experiment. Now, th this is exactly the same slide as the the explanation of the Bragg version of the experiment, but I, I've just um, tried to change um, the, the words uh, for uh, the x-rays into uh, electrons, but I, I also realized I didn't do it every day. So I've got to change this for you. I've got to redo this slide. Um, here we're shining electrons, not x-rays, onto the crystal. So this beam now is a beam of electrons that is being directed down and towards the right. Uh, they're scattering off uh, the top layer and the uh, bottom layer of some crystal, say sodium chloride here. Um, those those reflected rays are traveling over here up and towards the right, and they're going to interfere. And if this extra distance here, that the that the 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 rays that are reflected from the bottom surface compared to the rays that are reflected from the top surface, if this extra distance is 2d sine theta. So there's a d sine theta here on the left. There's another d sine theta extra path length over here on the right. If that 2d sine theta is a whole number of electron wavelengths, then you're going to get constructive interference of the electrons. So you see a lot of scattered electrons. If it happened to be that extra distance was half a wavelength, electron wavelength, or three halves or five halves electron wavelength, then you're going to get destructive interference and so this was the this was the idea uh and you know miracle uh he saw this these patterns of constructive and destructive interference so he um was the first person to establish without doubt that electrons uh exhibit wave-like properties okay well i just explained how we know that electrons have wave-like properties. Uh, we know because they uh, exhibit interference and diffraction effects. It's just the same way that we know x-rays or visible light has wave-like properties is because they exhibit interference and di diffraction effects. Um, so at this point, we have discovered, we, we started by the idea that particles of matter might have wave-like properties. But now we've discovered, for example, that electrons have wave-like wave -like properties. That is, we've reached the point where both our particles of nature and our, our light waves, they they both exhibit wave-like and path-like particle-like properties. They're both wave-particle identities. They 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 both have this kind of dual dual identity, what we call duality. They exhibit particle-like properties in having energies and having momenta. They exhibit wave-like properties in having um, and frequency uh, wave-like properties in having wavelengths and and frequencies. I'm gonna try and answer this question here that's posed. Let's compare the wavelengths of a 10 electron volt kinetic energy electron and a 10 electron volt energy photon. So as a um, example of this synthesis 
of matter and light into wave particle like entities. Let's take a electron and let's take a photon with a certain energy, 10 electron volts, and figure out the wavelengths of corresponding to that 10 electron volt kinetic energy for the for the photon and for the electron. So let's let's go ahead and do that. Let me make a, a an important remark just down here. Um, the the wavelengths are not the same for the 10 electron volt electron and 10 electron volt photon. They're not the same because um, in one case, the, the photon is the quintessential example of a relativistic particle. It travels at the speed of light. The electron, this energy of 10 electron volts is much, much smaller than the electron's rest mass. That's, that's half a million electron volts. And so it's a, actually an example, this 10 electron volt electron is a, a, an example of a, um, uh, a, a electron that's non-relativistic, where we don't have to worry about relativity. So that means that there's a very different relationship between the energy of the electrons and, the, uh, and their momentum and the energy of a photon and their momentum. So we're gonna make sure we account for that. We can use this relationship here that the kinetic energy of the 10 electron volt electron is given by the momentum squared by divided by twice the mass. This is this is a version of one half mv squared. This is a, a non-relativistic energy momentum relationship. And use that for the electron. We're going to use this guy for the photon. This is the energy momentum relationship for a um, uh, a. a a particle that's massless, or a particle that's traveling at the speed of light, like a photon. So this is the key difference. And this is going to mean that when we take these two energies and calculate the two momenta, they're going to be different. And then when we calculate the two momenta, the, the wavelengths are going to be different. OK, so let's go ahead and do that. I, I've actually done it here. Uh, upstairs here is the 10 electron volt electron. Uh, downstairs here is the 10 electron volt photon. And we're going to take that particle-like characteristic, the energy of the electron, the photon, uh, and figure out the corresponding uh, wavelength here for the electron and downstairs here for the, the photon. As I say, the key difference in these two calculations is that in one case, you've got a low speed kind of non-relativistic particle, the electron. And in that case, the energy that's quoted, 10 electron volts, is related to the momentum by this equation here. And then in the other case, you've got this quintessential example of a relativistic particle. It's a photon. It's massless. It's traveling at the speed of light. Its energy is related to its momentum down here. And so we need this energy-momentum relationship. And that, that's the only difference in these two calculations. So I'll go through pretty quickly through the calculations because we want the wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength for the electron. We want the de Broglie wavelength for our photon. Um, the uh, wavelength is related to the momentum by the de Broglie equation relating wavelength of the matter waves or the, or the waves to the momentum of the particles. And so we're going to use that actually in both, both cases here. It's just that we're going to replace the momentum in the denominator here for the electron with this um, non-relativistic relationship to its energy, kinetic energy. So that's from the energy relationship upstairs here. And for the photon, we're going to replace the momentum of the photon with the relativistic relationship to the energy here. So that's from this equation here. So those are the, the only differences. And then all, all I do is plug in the numbers. I just plug in the numbers. Now, in this calculation, it's because I'm working with energies in electron volts. Both of my, my photon and my electron have 10 electron volts. So I'm going to, I use here uh, Planck's constant in the units of electron volts. That just makes, this, this would make our lives much easier. If the energies are quoted in electron volts, work with Planck's constant in electron volts. For some reason, the energies were in joules, you know, work with Planck's constant in, in, in units of joules. 
Um, but so here I'm using the, the version of Planck's constant in electron volts is, is four times 10 to the minus 15 electron volts seconds. Uh, so I plug that in, in both equations, upstairs and downstairs. Then I, I'm in both equations, um, employing either this relationship here to the kinetic energy. So here's in the square root is twice the mass of the electron. I said it's half a million electron volts of a C squared times the kinetic energy of the electron is just 10 electron volts. I plug that in. And if you do the calculation, um, I got about 0.4 nanometers. So nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters. So about 0.4 times 10 to the minus nine meters. And then if you do the same thing for the photon, uh, so the, the difference in the photon calculation is that is that here we got Planck's constant again, but now we're uh, multiplying by this factor here, the speed of light divided by the um, energy the uh, of the, the photon, and that comes out to be 123 nanometers. So look, it's interesting. The, they had the same energies, but one was one was non-relativistic, and one was highly relativistic. So although they had the same energies, they have very different wavelengths. Actually, um, one, one wavelength, the wavelength for the electron, is the size scale of atoms. So this is the kind of wavelength that uh, the experiment that we described that dis dis um, discovered electron waves, this is the kind of energy and wavelength that that experiment employed, deployed. Uh, this wavelength of the photon is much, much longer. It's the size scale of many, many atoms. Um, it's actually a wavelength, uh, if you think about, oops, sorry. Think about the wavelengths of visible light. There's four, 400 to 700 nanometers. This is shorter than those wavelengths. So it's ultraviolet light. This is ultraviolet light. But it's not the X-rays that were used to... Um, using interference and diffraction, discover the lattice arrangement of the uh, ions or the atoms in a in a crystal. So this is a much, much longer wave. Okay. I want to move on to the la last topic for today's class. And um, uh, that topic is to do with the consequences of the consequences of particles of nature, light, having both uh, wave and particle light properties. Um, but, but let me just remark first, before I move on to that, just how strange it really is that light can have wave-like, particle-like properties, um, and electrons can have wave-like, particle-like properties. Uh, here's, a, here's a statement. I want to make this statement. Electrons sometimes behave as if they're waves, and electrons sometimes behave as if they're particles. So that's that's what we have to imagine electrons are. They are something that sometimes behaves like a wave, and it's something that behaves like a particle. Likewise for photons too. They're, there's something, whatever it is, an entity that behaves like a wave sometimes, and sometimes behave as if they're, they're particles. Uh, there's some key words that I wanted to point out here, this first bullet, sometimes behave. So an electron is never simultaneously behaving like a wave and behaving like a particle. That never happens. When you make an observation of an electron, you might see its particle-like properties. When you make an observation of an electron, you might see its wave-like properties, but you never simultaneously see its wave-like and particle-like properties. Same for a photon too. Uh, a photon never simultaneously behaves like a particle and a wave. Uh, if you make an observation of a photon, you might observe its particle-like properties, or you might observe its wave-like properties. Um, you, you never see um, both of those properties together. Uh, also, next bullet, I use the word as if, behaves as if a wave, behaves as if a particle. Why, why am I putting in the word as if? I'm putting in the word as if because an electron is not a wave, an electron is not a particle, a photon is not a wave, it is not a particle. It's just that sometimes it's 
behaving as if it were a wave or as if it were a particle. So importantly, very importantly, an, an electron is, as, is actually neither a wave nor a particle, is something more complicated, something much more, uh, much more complicated that we have no everyday experience of. It's just something that can exhibit both types of characteristics. And a photon, a photon is not simply a wave, it's not simply a particle, it's something that's more complicated, more strange, that we have no everyday experience of. And so I wanted to make those remarks. Okay, let's have a quiz question, and then I'll go on to discuss the um, indeterministic nature versus the deterministic nature of um, of the quantum quantum universe. So let me see if I can set this up for you. Um, I'm gonna. Okay, so you won't see me doing this because I'm going to a different screen, and I'm gonna post the. Post the lecture quiz. So I, I, I'll give you a, a minute to think about it, but you can do, I mean, you can complete this during the class, after the class, as long as you complete it by Tuesday, uh, by uh, Monday, Monday midnight, that's, that's perfectly fine. I, I don't think it's a complicated, it's not a hard question to ask, answer. Um, okay, so I believe I just published the quiz. And here is the quiz. And the quiz says, let's, let's consider a truck. 10,000 kilogram truck. So it's, a, it's a big truck. And it's traveling at 30 miles per hour. This truck is traveling at 30 miles per, per hour. It has, according to Bro de Broglie's hypothesis, and it has, according to the matter wave discovery, it has an associated matter wave. That matter wave is given by de Broglie's equation. The matter wave is the uh, Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the object. So is that matter wave too large to be observed in everyday life? Is it too small to be observed in everyday life? Or can we observe it in everyday life? That that matter wave is way too small, way too small to be observed in everyday life. It's just like the basket, we, we looked at the basketball's matter wave. An everyday object with everyday speeds, everyday masses, their wavelengths, like the trucks, is way, way, way too small to be observed in everyday life. And so we notice none of this. No, none of this strange quantum behavior in our everyday lives is therefore very hard for us to picture, imagine, understand this strange quantum behavior at the microscopic scales of, of matter. Okay. Last topic. Wave-particle duality. That's the, that's the sort of formal name that we give to this idea that uh, matter, particles of matter exhibit both wave-like and particle-like characteristics. Uh, light exhibits both wave-like, particle-like characteristics. We call that wave-particle duality. So it's a formal name to it. That was a tipping point in physics. It was a tipping point between two kind of views of the universe. It was a tipping point between kind of a, what we would call a deterministic, clockwork, classical universe, be before wave particle duality, and a indeterministic, probabilistic, quantum universe. That's after wave particle duality. This idea that we've stepped from clockwork universe to probabilistic universe is best, is best embodied by a principle, a physics principle, a physics principle of quantum world uh, that's called the uncertainty principle. And so in these last 15 minutes, 
I want to talk talk about the the uncertainty principle. It's 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 due to a uh, a scientist uh, Werner Heisenberg that first realized the implications of of wave particle duality. So let let me um, go through a few bullets here uh, that basically outline or describe what Heisenberg realized and what led to the uncertainty principle, which sort of codifies this um, uh, this probabilistic, indeterministic, fuzzy nature of quantum universe. So, as I say, Heisenberg was first to, to see, to recognize, to understand that wave particle duality, it, it, it sort of implies a couple of things. It implies that there's a, a limit on knowledge. There's a limit on how much you can know in the subatomic world. There's a limit on how much you can know about, say, an electron in the subatomic world. There's a limit on how well you can know, say, its position and its momentum in the sub subatomic world. That's one thing. Also, there's a statement here. Oops. Observing nature orders nature. It's a very important in statement in the subatomic world. If if you want to know a particle's position, electrons' position, if you don't want to know a particle's velocity, electrons' velocity, you have to measure the particle's position. You have to measure the particle's velocity. Um, in quantum world, whenever you measure a particle's position, you measure a particle's velocity, you, you're going to disturb the particle. And that's what observing nature, i.e. measuring the position, measuring the uh, velocity, alters nature means that you've affected the system uh mean so you you can't you can't know something measure something observe something without changing that something without ordering that something and that's observing nature orders nature at the quantum world um just to give a, a couple more bullets about it in classical physics right we have no problem imagining that you could simultaneously and precisely know the uh, position and the momentum of an object. Think of a basketball. In in classical world of basketballs, th there's no reason why, at least in principle, I can't know the position of the basketball and the momentum of the basketball exactly. It's, it's perfectly okay in classical physics. In quantum physics, in quantum world, you can't simultaneously know the the position of a quantum object, an electron, and the momentum of a quantum object precisely. You can't know both of those things precisely. So that's very different. It has the consequence that um, in, the, in the classical world, in principle, in the classical world, if, if we, we could measure the positions of all the particles in a, in a classical world, in a Newtonian world, if we could measure the momentum of all the particles in a classical world, in the Newtonian world, if we knew the forces in the classical world, in the Newtonian world, then if we knew them at one moment or one instant, we could use the laws of nature to predict them at the next, what's the situation at the next moment? And what's the situation at the next moment? And what's the situation at the next moment? And the future and future and future. We could predict the future exactly. That's a clockwork universe. In the quantum universe, um, we can't know the positions and the, the mena of velocities of the particles of nature. There's a limit on how well we can know the positions and velocities of the particles of nature. And so we can't predict the future exactly. If we can't know where every particle is and what every particle's um, velocity or momentum is, we can't predict what will happen exactly in the future. We can only um, have probabilities, chances for the future. The, the chance of this outcome is this percent. The chance of that outcome is this that percent. And so that's a funda very fundamental difference. Um, if you went back to the time of the development of quantum theory, of the quantum world, so this is back into the um, first, you know, two, two or three decades of the, the 1900s, um, this was a huge argument. This was a huge problem about stepping from a world that in classical physics was deterministic to a world that was um, not deterministic. Um, 
it's a world where Einstein broke from rain, mainstream science. He was not prepared. Albert Einstein was not prepared to believe in this in in deterministic nature of the universe. And it, uh, it led to Einstein being sort of um, uh, off on, on, on his own isolated iron, island with his, with his physics, because he wouldn't be, believe that um, the quantum world things were in, indeterministic. Okay, uh, this whole idea is codified in an uncertainty principle, a Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Uh, that's an equation, a formula that, that embodies this, this indeterministic feature of the universe. So I want to I want to talk about that. I want to try and motivate it first. I want to motivate it by just thinking a little bit about waves and about the nature of waves. Supposing we let's go to the beach. Let's go to the beach and let's look at the water waves. And supposing I, I ask you, can you tell me exactly where that weight or water wave is? And can you um Tell me exactly what the wavelength of that water wave is. So I pose that question. I want to know exactly where the wave water wave is and exactly where the um, uh, the wavelength of the water wave. So those are the two features of the wavelength. But you actually can't tell me both those things, right? You can't tell me both those things because a, a, a wave, a water wave, for example, is this kind of smooth and continuous and spread out thing. Um, specifically. Let me look at two extremes and try and answer the question, what is the wavelength? What is the position of the water wave? This is one on the left here, and there's one on the right here, the same question, but they're the two extremes of it. Look at these water waves. So this is, I, I, I went to a nice calm lake, and I just saw the ripples of water waves across the lake, very, uh, very calming. Um, in this particular case, you could probably tell me the wavelength. So that's the distance from crest to crest. Look at these crests here. Looks like there's, you know, a wavelength for these water waves. And you could tell me that that's 10 centimeters or 20 centimeters or whatever it is. But you couldn't tell me where this water wave was. This water wave is everywhere in this picture. We can't localize this water wave. It's an example that with waves, for example, water waves, uh, if the wavelength is well known, the wavelength on the left here is well known, the, the uh, position is poorly known. I called X the position here. That's poorly known. Here's the other extreme. This is a very interesting phenomenon. You can see this at the beach. You know, literally see this at the beach um, as the, the waves roll in. Um, you'll see as waves interfere with one another, um, you can see these sort of crests or peaks of waves. It's actually given a name, it's called a soliton. Um, I could ask you, what's the, what's the position of wavelength of this, this wave here? Well, this one, you could say, oh, look, I, I can tell you where it is. It's right here in the middle of the screen. It's, it's right at this location. But in this case, you couldn't tell me the wavelength. This wave, this sort of peak wave here, is actually constructed, built out of many different wavelengths. It, it is assembled, constructed from a whole range of wavelengths. And so this is an example of the other extreme, where you could tell me where this water wave is. So X, the position, is well known, but the... Um, the wavelength is poorly known because it involves a whole range of, of wavelengths. So for for water waves, for sound waves, for you know everyday life waves, you you probably already understand just based on your, your common sense, your common notions, right? That for a water wave, you can you can tell me the wavelength if in the case on the left, but you can't tell me the position. You can tell me the position in the case on the right, but you can't tell me the wavelength. And um, that's just a, a feature that seems common sense, seems to intuition for for water waves and, and, and also for sound waves. Well, here's the interesting thing. Uh, now we've given electrons and other subatomic particles wave-like properties. Um, 
they would inherit this feature that you couldn't simultaneously know the position of the electron if it's got wave-like properties and the wavelength of the electron. Now, the interesting thing there is, well, the, the position is one characteristic of the electron that we talked about. The wavelength is the related to the other characteristic that we talked about, which is the speed of the momentum. So based on this analogy for water waves, for cell waves, if, if electrons, subatomic particles, have wave-like properties, we wouldn't expect to be able to determine both the um, position of an electron and the momentum, which is related to the wavelength of the electron. And so that's um, that's a that's a key feature of the sub subatomic world. And so that's this kind of business that you can't simultaneously know the location and the speed of an electron because it has like sound waves, water waves, wave-like properties. There's an equation that goes with that. I'm going to jump on slide to that equation. It's this equation here. This is the uncertainty principle. So this is Heisenberg's famous uncertainty principle. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about this equation. I'll solve one quick example of this equation. This delta x, delta here means the uncertainty, the uncertainty in measuring the position. This delta p, delta again means the uncertainty. This is the uncertainty in measuring the momentum. In the quantum world, you simultaneously can't know the position exactly and the momentum exactly of an electron or other subatomic particle. There's a limit. What is the limit? Who's going to set the limit? I bet you could guess this. Planck's constant is going to set the limit because it sets the limit, the scale of everything in the quantum world. So the product of your knowledge of the uncertainty, your uncertainty in the position and the uncertainty of the momentum has to be bigger than, has to be more than, has to be greater than, uh, Planck's constant, Planck's constant actually divided by four pi. And so this is the uncertainty relationship. It implies that supposing you knew X really well, the position of the electron really well, then to exceed Planck's constant over four pi, you must only know the momentum of the electron poorly. Alternatively, supposing you knew the momentum really well, then if you knew the momentum really well, for this product to exceed Planck's constant over four pi, it implies you could only know the, the position poorly. And so this uncertainty principle embodies this kind of fuzziness, graininess of the subatomic world, this indeterministic, probabilistic, uncertain nature of the subatomic world. Let's just apply it to an everyday example an everyday example, um, meaning something from everyday life, and, and see whether it matters in our everyday lives. It matters in the quantum world, the world of electrons, atoms, molecules, uh, atomic nuclei, protons and neutrons. It matters in that world, but does it matter in an everyday world? Um, let's, let's calculate the uncertainty in a cat's momentum based on the uncertainty in a cat's position. So we're asked to imagine um, a two kilogram cat. We've got this two kilogram cat and we know the position of the cat it's sitting there on the sofa. We know it to a tenth of a millimeter. What is the uncertainty of the momentum in the cat? How well could we know the cat's momentum based on the uncertainty principle? Well, so this is an example of this uncertainty relationship. The uncertainty in the, the relationship says that the uncertainty in the position times the uncertainty in the momentum, that product of those two uncertainties, it has to be greater and or equal to the uh, value of Planck's constant divided by four pi. So I'm just going to rearrange this to find the uncertainty in the momentum of the cat, knowing the uncertainty over here on the right, in the position of the cat. So I'm just dividing through by um, delta x. That's the uh, uncertainty that I know to figure out the uncertainty that I want. So I, I rearrange the equation that the order of the uncertainty in the momentum is Planck's constant divided by four pi times the uncertainty in the position. 
Uh, I plug in Planck's constant. I'm using joule seconds here um, uh, because we're thinking of an ed everyday object. I plug in, oops, I plug in the um, position uncertainty of a, gosh, position uncertainty, 10 to the uh, a millimeter or 10 to the minus four of a meter for the cap. And that tells me the uncertainty of the momentum. Look, this uncertainty in momentum is absolutely, absolutely tiny. It's extremely tiny. It's extremely tiny because in our everyday world, again, just like the um, matter waves of basketballs or trucks, the uncertainty principle applied to basketballs or trucks or cats is a negligible effect. In the everyday world, what the world we experience, you can, in principle, measure things as precisely as you like until you get down to this subatomic scale, this atomic scale, where uncertainty, the fact that you can't know exactly the position of momentum, starts to become an important effect. Okay, just wanted to end on this side. It's an analogy between the uncertainty principle and uh, a Chinese restaurant menu. So um, I made this copy of a, a restaurant men menu. And um, in, in this restaurant menu, um, supposing we're going to get the meal for two persons. You can, um, you can select items. You're going to select two items. You're going to select, the rules are, though, you've got to select one item from group A, that's over here on the left-hand side. So it might be sweet and sour shrimp. And you've got to select one item from group B. It might be the roast pork with veg. You cannot simultaneously select position and momentum in the menu. We cannot simultaneously know both these quantities. These are what's called complementary variables. The position and the momentum in the quantum world are called complementary variables. And you can't know, you can't order here. You can't know both of them. You can only pick one. There are other examples of complementary variables. Just to mention this, another classic one is energy and time. You can't know the uh, energy of an object and the, the energy at that, the time interval for that object with, uh, uh, there's some limit on the precision for that. And so you can't select two items here from group B. And so this is like, a, a, I tried to make this as an, a, an analogy to um, uh, pairs of quantities in quantum physics, where you can know one, but not the other, or the other, but not the first. And so it's an analogy to uh, the position and momentum uncertainty principle. Anyway, I'll, I'll end there. Um, we've discussed the idea, the concept of matter waves, the hypothesis of matter waves in the matter wave equation, lambda equals P, sorry, Planck's constant divided by momentum. And then we've um, uh, looked at the discovery of matter waves. That was a big breakthrough. And then we've looked at implications of wave particle duality. We've looked at the uh, codification of those implications in, in um, the uncertainty principle. And we talked about the idea of deterministic, indeterministic universes in classical and quantum physics. Uh, if you've got any questions, I'll hang on here. You can put them in chat or you can um, put on your microphone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining me that. To have a few of you here to go through, that was super helpful. If I try to do this on my own, it would be super difficult.